From humble beginnings with a desire to serve the Dudley community, Bank of Dudley has grown to five locations, serving Lawrence, Twiggs, and surrounding counties. Serving our community since 1905, the Bank of Dudley is looking forward to its second century of community banking. Drop in today to any of our five locations, Jeffersonville, Dudley, East Dublin, Veterans Boulevard, and Downtown Dublin. Bank of Dudley, member FDIC, and an equal housing lender. Allen's Heating and Cooling is your licensed Amana equipment dealer. Trust Allen's Heating and Cooling to install and service your heating and cooling unit. Allen services all brands and with the purchase of a new Amana, offers a lifetime compressor warranty. Call Sean Clark or any of his friendly staff at Allen's Heating and Cooling. You're a Amana dealer. Amana lasts and lasts and lasts. Good morning and welcome to the Dublin Lawrence County uh, Chamber of Commerce and this beautiful building here. This is McGrath Keene Center. And I know some of y'all have been looking around at the portraits on the wall. Your portrait can be the next one there. <laughs> Just see uh, Malia afterwards and we'll sign the paperwork. Sounds good. And I want to recognize Miss Willie Polk in her beautiful purple coat there. This uh, building here was her vision and so we thank you so much for that. But Heath couldn't be here today. He gives his regards and regrets. He's in uh, Augusta at a board meeting for the Shepherd Community Blood Center. And uh, on behalf of the board of directors and Heath and the staff, welcome here today. Uh, and we want to thank all you ladies for coming today and taking your time, from, your valuable time from work and home. Who has twins in here? 14 months old twins. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, uh, but we appreciate you coming and supporting this sold out event. Uh, and we're so excited that a homegrown young lady will be bringing the word of God to us today and get some application for our daily lives. And I see these guys around here, we better learn something while we're here, haven't we? <laughs> I'm sure there's something for us too. But uh, we wanna thank Agape Care for their sponsorship. We'll hear from them in just a second. Thank Dino's for the beautiful catering today, delicious catering. And uh, we want to thank Wyndham Greenhouse for the beautiful mums. And those will be coming uh, door prizes here at the end of the session today. Now, if you would, uh, we're going to open up in an invocation and thanks for the food. If you would, just pray along with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you again today for just a beautiful day of life. The beautiful sunshine out there today, the crisp. Uh, temperatures that we've been waiting for and we can just see you in the nature out there and we thank you Lord that we can believe in you and have a fellowship with you while we're here on earth and by believing you we'll end up spending eternity with you father we thank you for a great country we pray that you'll be with our country with all the issues that we're dealing with as far as COVID be with all the uh, hospitals the health care workers and folks who make decisions there we do thank you for the Dublin Lawrence County Chamber of Commerce our staff members and all the chamber members, we ask that you bless them. We do thank you for Sandra and her ministry and the word from Jesus that she's going to bring with us today, talking about words. Uh, we pray that you'll continue to bless her and Andy at the church there. Continue to bless Agape Care and the wonderful ministry they have. Uh, bless each and every woman here today, Lord. Bless them, especially in their homes. Bless them in their vocations. And thank you for what they mean to us. So we thank you. Uh, in advance for everything you're going to do for us today. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you, thank you. We're excited to have with us today uh, the sponsor of our program today, which is Agape Care, and we're going to hear from uh, Richard in just a second. Uh, they have just expanded their coverage in the Georgia area, and he'll tell us about that. But we're so glad that he's here. And, you know, agape uh, can, means Christian love. Of course, you already know that, and we're excited to, to see that. Their mission statement is to serve with love, providing comfort and support through compassionate care and meaningful experiences. And uh, I've already actually recommended uh, your services to my brother in South Carolina. 
his, uh, we're, we receiving some care from y'all in his fight against cancer. So we appreciate that so much. And of course, uh, your last name uh, has some meaning as far as friendly and dynamic. And it only takes a few minutes of being around him to understand how dynamic he is. And I was told by somebody that you may have, did you ever coach a wrestling team? Um, I, I wrestled a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, my son was a, I heard you yeah, that y'all had some success in that area. I'm not going to mess with him. Look at him. You know, he's, <laughs> he's pretty bold there. But uh, we appreciate uh, what you're doing, and we'd like for you to come up here and just share a little bit about your program. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, sir. And hi, folks, and, and thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I did have the pleasure of addressing uh, the group one morning. Oh, goodness. I think it was the, the first meeting in August. Now I'll talk about the same things that I did then and I was concerned this morning. I'm saying, God, I hope I have a different outfit on. So <laughs> if there's any photographic evidence of my previous interaction here, I think I had a different shirt on, I'm hoping. So <laughs> but anyway, that's always important. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is just tell you a little bit about who Agape Care is and then talk a little bit about hospice care. And we'll touch on the value to the patient the value to the surviving spouse, and the value to the Medicare system. Because hospice is a very misunderstood type of care. Um, folks have such a concern that, oh my goodness, does this mean mama's gonna die? And folks, um, the fact of the matter is there's not a person on this earth that someday isn't going to pass. And when that is, only God knows. What we know about the hospice Medicare benefit is that it can provide additional support in the home for someone who has symptoms similar to another group of patients who may, should the disease continue to progress, pass in six months or less. We don't know when we admit someone to our care that that particular individual is going to pass in six months. I can tell you, oh, it was a few years back in Morgantown, West Virginia. We had an individual on service for seven years, seven. Now our chief compliance officer was a former Medicare fraud prosecutor. So you can imagine how much that particular um, patient was reviewed to make sure that they met the admission criteria for decline to remain on our service. So without going into too much detail there. Let me circle back and talk about Agape Care. We are, we were founded in South Carolina and we're the merger or the marriage of the Agape Care Group and Hospice Care of South Carolina. At the time when those two companies merged, uh, Agape was the number one provider in South Carolina and Hospice Care of South Carolina was the number two provider. It was based on the quality of care and services provided. So we benefit from the best and the best coming together to share best practices to continue to support you know, the, the patients under our care. Our first venture in Georgia came in Augusta with a startup. Oh, goodness, we, our license was going to expire if we didn't have a patient on in calendar year 2020 and we were fortunate enough to admit our first patient December 31st at 5 p.m. So we, we just made it there. That branch is doing, doing exceptionally well. I've been in this industry for 15 years, and I can tell you it is the most successful hospice startup that I've, I've witnessed and various reasons um, with that. So recently in June, we purchased Serenity Hospice. And then in July, we've also purchased Integrity Hospice. So that's what brings us into the Dublin marketplace. And we currently serve patients in 82 counties, is it? Um, from essentially the Florida Georgia border, follow on up through I-75. Uh, a little bit about our operation in South Carolina. We have four hospice houses there, and we did acquire the Serenity Hospice House Serenity Place here. And we're the only provider with a pediatric hospice division. And we are truly a pediatric provider in South Carolina. It's our intent to bring that same service here. And what I mean by that is the nurses who see our pediatric patients only see pediatric patients. Our nurses who see adults 
only see adults. They won't swing between. So it's truly a, a, a pediatric division. So let me pause on that and transition to the benefit of hospice care to the patient. It's not the intent of hospice to hasten death or prolong life. It is the intent of hospice to provide comfort to the patient as well as extended loved ones. But here's the fact of the matter. There was a study done following over 4,000 patients and they found that patients who elect hospice care actually do live longer. It's the quality of care in the home and it's the, would you say, the elimination of stress. Stress is a very difficult thing, but patients do live longer. So we have the value to the patient. Kaiser Permanente, a large healthcare provider in, on the West Coast, did a study and they wanted to see, well, what happens to the surviving spouse? So they followed the surviving spouses of former hospice patients the year following the spouse's death. And they found that the surviving spouse of former hospice patients actually needed to utilize the health care system less the year following the death than the surviving spouse of non-hospice patients. They attributed that quality of life to the bereavement process which follows the surviving spouse or any other loved ones identified for at least 13 months after the death. So patients live longer, their surviving spouse also has a better quality of life. So then I said, well, what does this cost? And Lord knows, you know, what our debt is in federal government and concerns about Medicare. This has to be something that cost the government a lot of money. Uh, Duke did a study a few years back and they found that when patients elect hospice care, they not only live longer, but they save the Medicare system dollars. So as we look at that, putting it all together, Patient actually lives longer, their surviving spouse is better served the year following the death, and our resources, government, and please, we never, we should never look at dollars as a driver toward what our medical care is. This is just an after the fact. We don't refer people to hospice to save the government money, but the federal government saves money. So patients are better served, surviving spouse is better served, and we actually, can save the government money and, and basically that, oh no, I forgot my team. Oh goodness, we, may I introduce the team that's here from Serenity, Agape, and Integrity Hospice. And I feel like a sports announcer. On a side note, um, I, my son, I was the president of our local Little League baseball game. And through the course of time, I'm gonna say I probably announced 500 Little League games. So if this starts to sound like Next up, wearing number two. <laughs> and and the, is that mauve, Liz? So what color is it? We have Liz Dixon, one of the members of our sales team. Lindsay Reed, one of the members of our sales team. And our local administrator, Dustin Williamson. And, and then Ashley Vickers is our regional operations director. And, and on behalf of five of us, uh, we'd like to say thank you once again for the, for the time today. The City of Dublin Natural Gas provides the most cost-efficient source of energy available today. So for your home, choose the most natural resource. Safe, clean, efficient. All new subdivisions around the Dublin area have natural gas available. Start reducing your energy bills today with Dublin City Natural Gas Department. Natural gas, the smart choice. Call 277-5048 today and let us help you start saving today. They work all week for Friday night. Get rid of the ball, get rid of the ball. And when you call, click, or visit Dublin Chevy Nissan, you'll see our teamwork in action. Let me put your dream in your driveway. Let's take a test drive. The right vehicle, the right experience, the right dealer. And remember, Don sells cars well only at Dublin Chevy Nissan. You'll score a winning deal every time at Dublin Chevy Nissan. Well, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker today. <laughs> as, as, we, uh, as we do that, uh, I'd like to share a few things in reference to her. Uh, 
and I don't know what the deal is here, but uh, just in case, we'll find out what this means in a minute, okay? But uh, we're so excited. We do have a hometown girl here. We're great to have her parents, Jackie and Bob Walker, here with us. And uh, I think I saw sister-in-law over here, Buffy. And uh, Backpack Jack is not with us today. He is uh, around there. But we're so uh, excited to have them, have her today. She and her husband, Andy, actually founded North Point uh, Ministries back in 1995. You won't believe this, but she's been married 33 years. She has kids in her 20s, which she could pass for that, right? <laughs> there you go, there you go. Okay, that'll help a little bit, maybe. Um, but she's an uh, author of two women's devotional books with companion videos. One of them's called A Comparison Trap. And uh, it's a, a, a good study. It's, and she says, the temptation to compare is as near as your next chat with a friend a trip to the store, a check-in, and whether you come out on top or come up lacking, there's simply no win in comparison. It's a trap. So uh, that's, that's I'd, I'd love to get into some of that too. Uh, she also has two more books, one uh, entitled For the Moms and one for the Women, and they're entitled Breathing Room. And it, she says you're uh, multitasking your way through motherhood for those of us who, I mean, for those of y'all who've been in there. <laughs> My bad, my bad. <laughs> Filling your calendar, draining your bank account, and uh, missing out on memories along the way. You're efficient but exhausted, weighed down by more than the toddler on your hip and that diaper bag slung over your shoulder. With one surprising, uh, simple invitation, God offers a way to trade your overwhelming pace for that one that will bring you peace. So we could probably all relate to that. Uh, and her ministry passion is promoting foster care in the local church and her involvement with the Foster Together at their church is huge up there. She received her undergraduate degree from, I can't, can you help me with this one? <laughs> Please, can you help me? She received her undergraduate degree from a school in Atlanta, what's that called? Georgia Tech? <laughs> <laughs> he said it, he said it, I did <laughs> That's good, that's good. But. Honestly, uh, Sandra, my brother, God bless him, he's a 1964 grad of Georgia Tech. He should be on parole before long. <laughs> so, text my number two team. Text my number two. But, and then she got a master's degree at Chris, in Christian studies from Dallas Theological Seminary, and much of her time these days spent working on various writing projects and continuing her involvement with the fostering together. Uh, her topic today is a way to words and you know growing up of course i'm much older than anybody in here there used to be a saying sticks and stones may break my bone but words will never harm me what do you say that <laughs> not not exactly not exactly so uh, at this time please welcome sandra she shares about the weight of our words and dad also graduated from tech so we got you were double offens offensive offensive <laughs> so, um, well, it is great to be here. It's so good to be home um, in this season of my life. So Andy and I have been married 33 years. Our kids are 29, 27, 29, 27, and 26. And so in this season, we've, our foster daughter's 21. Um, so in this season of life, I've got a lot more flexibility, and it's fun to be able to say yes to more things kind of like this. So, But it's always good to come home. You know, a speaking engagement is a speaking engagement, but coming home to Dublin is always a special thing. In fact, we got married at First Baptist of Dublin, and we had our reception here. The building, this building wasn't here, so I threw my bouquet off the balcony over there. At, we call it Danda's house because it was the Morris house, and Danda, she was Danda to us because her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren were all like family to us. So, um, so yeah, our reception, I cut my cake right there outside those doors, so this is kind of a special place for for me, but I'm not here to walk down memory lane, I guess, so um, I'll get to what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, I do want to take a, just a few minutes to talk about a topic that I believe is your most important tool for success. It is your most important tool for success, so I'll talk about it for a few minutes, and then we'll turn it over and let y'all have some table discussion. We've got some questions on your table for you. Um, but this particular topic is a really, really big deal, and it's a big deal because it can make or break you in your job. 
It can make or break you in your relationships. It can make or break you in your parenting or your grandparenting or your aunting or fathering or grandfathering. It can make and break you in your marriage. And it's that thing that when you meet somebody new, um, it's the thing that they use to judge whether or not you are a good potential friend, whether or not you're a good potential hire, or whether or not you're a good potential boss. It's that first thing that people engage with as it relates to you. In fact, of all the tools that you have acquired to help you in your business or in your relationships or in your families or in your careers, I'm convinced that this one is the most important one and the tool is simply your words, the words that come out of your mouth. So words, we use a lot of words in a day, right? We're all using words all day long. Sometimes we get them right. Sometimes we fail miserably with our words. We, cannot, we all have stories about that. But what we know is our words carry weight. Our words carry weight. And to your point, whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, A, they were either lying, trying to make you feel better, or trying to make you be tough, you know, or something, or they were just very, very, very confused because we all know words hurt. Words can hurt. Our words carry weight. They carry weight at work. They carry weight in our relationships, and they especially carry weight at home. Because they carry so much weight, um, there's a lot at stake with how we use our words. And most of us in this room can probably remember back to a time when our communication vehicles were completely different. Um, how many of you remember the days of no internet? You ever remember, most of you. How many of you, just for kicks, you don't really, your whole life you kind of had internet? Yeah, a few people, yeah, a handful of you. So, um, so what I'm gonna do for those of you who aren't with us on not remembering life without the internet, um, I'm gonna read you a little story. Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, actually for me it was over off of Hillcrest, um, there were people who could not instantly communicate with each other. To speak on the phone with someone, now pay attention because you're not gonna even believe what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> to speak on the phone with someone, you had to have a seven digit number memorized. It was before we were having to use area codes. Seven digit number memorized. If you didn't have it memorized, you had to look it up in a phone book. The phone book had every person in town's name in alphabetical order. And you'd look in there and you would see what the seven digit number was. You had to put your finger in a dial seven times based on the number and dial it around and then wait for it to roll back around again. Are you tracking with me? Yep. Um, also, you had no idea if the person you were calling was at home or not because there was no such thing as Find My Friends or Life360 or any of the tracking apps. You didn't know where they were when you were calling them. You were hoping they were at home. And to talk, that person had to be there near enough to the phone because nobody carried a phone with them when they left their house. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Nobody carried a phone with them when they left their house. If the person you were calling happened to already be talking on the phone to somebody else, you'd hear this horrible, annoying bang, 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 and you'd hang up and you'd have to wait and you'd call again. Also, the whole family shared one phone number. Crazy, right? Yeah, the whole family shared one phone number with everybody else, so if your sister or brother was on the phone, your friends couldn't call you, you couldn't call them, and there was no such thing as texting, no texting. There was no email, really, either, for a while, for a long time. To get a document or a picture to somebody or some instructions, you had to plan three or four days in advance and put it in an envelope and put these little square things on it. We call them stamps. You can still get them. Um, and you had to put those on there, and eventually your letter would get. So it was just a whole different, you had to want to say something, to say something to people. You really did. That was the world we lived in. It was incredibly primitive, I know. Um, I'm not sure how we did it, but we did. But communication now is so different. It is so different. In fact, a friend of mine, Jamie Dickens, did some research um, for a talk that he did about communications and words, and I asked him if I could steal his research, and he said I could. So listen to this. We are using and consuming more words than ever before by far. It's estimated that globally in 2020, people collectively sent 306 billion emails, 4.5 trillion text messages, 500 million tweets, and they watched 525 million hours of YouTube, and all of those numbers are in one day. 
per day. That's how many words we're using. It represents a lot of words. So we're using more words than ever before. But here's the thing about the words we're using now. We're thinking about our words less than ever before. We're thinking about our words less than ever before because it's so quick and easy to shoot off an email, to fire off a text to somebody, to construct a quick 140 character tweet and throw it out into the universe. And because it's so easy and quick to do that, we barely give our words thoughts before we just let them, let them go, right? We don't take time to craft our words like we used to when we were writing letters or when we were calling people and talking. We don't pause as much and take a few deep breaths when we're angry because it's just so easy to type it out and just send it, right? So we're not pausing as much. We're not counting the cost of our hurtful words as much as we used to. It's easier than ever to forget that making our point sometimes undermines our ability to make a difference in somebody's life. When we're speaking with a real person in, by phone or in person by face-to-face, -face, it's personal and we feel accountable for what we're saying. But when we're electronically firing off words, we don't feel the same thing. It's nothing personal. It's just business. Hello? That's how some people do things. Right away. To us, everything we do is personal. Because anyone can answer the call. It's who shows up that matters most. That's the quality of your independent agent. And the company that stands behind them. Ask Curry Maffet Insurance in Dublin if auto owners make sense for you. Imagine a life-changing injury. Imagine the fear and unknown. The Houston Clinic Sports Medicine Team, the only physicians in the area with advanced certification in orthopedic sports medicine, treat sports injuries with innovative techniques. The Houston Clinic has helped nearly a million athletes live without pain. Imagine getting back in the game. Imagine the best game of your life. The Houston Clinic Sports Medicine Team. King Solomon, who wrote most of the book of Proverbs in the Bible, and according to scripture was the wisest mere man to ever live, wrote that the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. That's in Proverbs 18. The tongue has the power of life and death. Words are not just content. Words have power. Words have the power to take life or give life. Your words can wound or your words can heal. Your words can be paralyzing to someone or your words can be very freeing to someone. Your words can halt things or launch things. Your words can push someone away and your words can draw someone in closer. And you get to choose which of those things you're gonna do. So why can our words do all that? Because, as Solomon said, our words inherently have the power of life and death. And it sounds kind of dramatic, words have power of life and death, sounds kind of dramatic, but here's the thing. Isn't it true that you can vividly remember some specific words that were said to you at some point in your life? Like you have a snapshot of the moment. They made an impression and they stayed with you even to this day, no matter how long ago they were, there are certain words that just make an impression. They were either life-giving words that someone shared with you, or those are always memorable and those are great, or sadly, they were life-taking words. And based on some research I'm gonna share with you in just a minute, life-taking words are far more memorable. They wound us deeply and we carry them with us longer. And, it, and whether it was life-giving or life-taking, you probably remember where, where you were, what you were doing, and you definitely remember who said those words to you, right? The good ones for some of us, they give us a shot, you know, they gave us a shot of confidence to, to follow through or to get something done that we were challenged to do. Um, they help us persevere through things. Those life-giving words just give us strength to persevere. Um, sometimes those words cast vision for our lives or for our futures. Um, Sometimes they just build up a resilience in us to get through a tough time. Somebody's life-giving words can give you the power to make it through and power through a hard time. And they were just words. They were just words. They didn't cost anything. They were just words. I have one that I will never, as long as I live, forget. So I'm going to share this with you. If somebody else happened to have heard these words when they were spoken to me, they wouldn't have meant anything to them. 
Um, if somebody had been sitting in the room when it happened, they might have smiled and thought, oh, that's sweet. But 29 years later, they wouldn't still have the snapshot of that moment in their head like I do. So my first child, Andrew, was about six months old. So this was 1992. Um, he was about six months old. He was in his high chair. And I was buzzing around the kitchen, you know, just kind of getting breakfast ready, doing my mom thing I was doing. I was a brand new mom. And I had this little bowl of mush. Remember how you fed your little ones, little bowls of mush, and just everything all mixed up together, and you would just sort of gag looking at it. But, you know, it was good for him, so you did it. Um, and so you mixed it all up. And um, so I did that. I had my little bowl of mush and had my cute little, you know, my cute little six-month-old. And I pulled my bar stool up to the, to the high chair and, um, and started feeding him his mush. And I'll pause here and tell you, I was skilled at feeding this mush to Andrew. I, I didn't make messes. I had the, I had the whole um, feed scrape, you know, thing. You know, you fed a little kid. I had the feed scrape thing down, and, um, and Andrew wasn't a spitter. So, so we, I was kind of rocking the, you know, mush thing. So I'll, I'll give you that, but that's significant um, for where I'm going with the story. But we're about halfway through the bowl of mush, and my dad came down the stairs. He had spent the night in Atlanta because he had something in Atlanta that next day. So he came downstairs, and he was watching me feed Andrew who was his first grandchild, by the way. Um, so, so dad's sipping his coffee, and he's just kind of watching. And in a few minutes, he said, Sandra, you're a really good mom. And th those were his exact words, because I remember. And all I was doing was feeding a bowl of mush to a six-month-old. I was not that impressive, even though I was skilled. But it was not that impressive. It wasn't super impressive, but dad thought it was. He thought it was. And his words weigh a 1,000 pounds to me. His words weigh a thousand pounds to me. His words were simple, but they were thoughtful. He didn't just spout it off. He watched for a minute and he told me what he saw. And it just cast vision for my motherhood. It sounds silly. It sounds like not a big deal, but because it was him, it was a big deal. His words meant so much more to me than if a thousand other people had said the same thing to me. His words were so heavy to me. They were so weighty. And they marked me, and they stayed with me. And 29 years later, I haven't forgotten it. There's this snapshot of what everything looked like in that moment in my brain. Um, fast forward about 28 years later, a similar thing happened in the fall of 2019, so a couple falls ago. A group of people approached me um, with a unique opportunity to lead something. And honestly, I couldn't understand how in the world there had been consensus that I would be equipped or able to do this thing, because it was a huge, huge job and a huge honor to be asked, um, extremely intense. And um, so after prayerful consideration, Andy and I had you know, gotten on our knees, really prayed that God would give us wisdom about whether I should say yes or no to this opportunity. Um, but after prayerful consideration, I realized I need to say no thank you. Um, this isn't my season to do something like that. And soon after I said no, we started laughing about it because it just seemed so preposterous. But Soon after I said no, Andy and I went to dinner with our second son, Garrett, and his wife, Danielle. And we were just kind of catching up about the week. We're sitting in a restaurant chatting. And we told them about the offer. And I laughed. And I said, I have no idea what made them think I was equipped to do that. And immediately, my daughter-in-law, Danielle, said, I know exactly why. And she proceeded to tick off a handful of reasons why she thought I would have been able to pull it off and, and handle that difficult job. And immediately, let, let me just tell y'all something. You want your mother-in-law to think that you're the best thing that ever happened to your son? You just say something like that, okay? Just a little tip, mother-in-law tip. Um, I don't know, maybe she was a fast thinker, and you know, or maybe you know, whether she was being honest or not, it didn't matter. Her words went a thousand pounds to me in that moment. Um, maybe I have some weird need for affirmation, but I don't think so. I think this is in all of us. Words matter. Words carry weight, and life-giving words set a trajectory, they cast vision, and they fill people's emotional tanks, and everybody has a need to have their emotional tanks filled. But then there are life-taking words, right? They're the life-taking ones, and these are the ones that sometimes just flow out of us thoughtlessly, right? They just flow out. Um, they're the ones we regret immediately, um, or at least we regret later when our, when our irritation or our anger subsides a little bit. We have regret around these. And sadly, these make an impression too, and they make a bigger impression sometimes than the good ones. Drop by today and see the winning team at Lakes Alignment and Truck Service in East Dublin. We're now offering tires and service for all your agricultural and farm equipment. At Lakes, we've got you covered on the road or in the field. 
big truck alignment, industrial tire pressing, and commercial truck service. So join the winning team at Lakes Alignment and Truck Service and now offering agricultural tire service. No matter where you are, call 272-4230 and our service trucks are rolling to you. Lakes Alignment and Truck Service, serving you at the same location right behind Thomas Auto Supply since 1954. So grab the family and head on out to the field. This football season, you're sure to be on a winning team when you join the team at Lakes Alignment and Truck Service and now Agricultural Tires and Service, Lakes Alignment, East Dublin. All right, boys, if you want to go to college, you have to clear out another one of these. What if we told you there was a better way to save for your kid's college than pickle jars? Morris Bank's Savings Builder account and Moolah makes saving for your kid's college easier than ever. All you have to do is connect the account to your debit card, where it automatically rounds up your purchases to the nearest dollar, depositing that spare change into a Moolah account where it will grow into a nice little nest egg for whatever your kids have their sights set on. Think about the last time you fired off an angry email. Can you remember that? You hit send and you immediately felt better. You're like, yeah, that'll teach them. They just, somebody had to say it. You know, somebody had to say it. So you, you, know, you kind of feel better um, for a few seconds and then a little time goes by and doubt starts creeping in and you can't get it back. You send that email, you don't get to get that thing back. Um, and you know, even your coworker, you know, it was all like, yeah, you did the right thing, you did the right thing, but you just, there's something in you, you just know that there was probably a better way to handle it. But you were mad in the moment and you didn't wait, you just fired it off. Um, or think about the last time you got in an argument with your friend or your coworker or somebody or your spouse, you know, if you're married and um, you just had enough and you just kind of let it out. It didn't, you, you know, it just came out and you saw their face fall or you realized immediately the depth of what you, the wound of, you know, of what you said, it was wrong, it wasn't helpful. You know, you, all of that kind of goes in you. If you're a parent, your words, again, weigh a thousand pounds with your kids, even if they are rolling their eyes and you know how girls are like, you know, doing that thing, your words still weigh a thousand pounds. So even if you think they're not listening, your words weigh a, a thousand pounds. So think about the last time you unleashed on one of your kids and again, you just watch the face fall or, or they storm out of the room. The hurt is deep and, and we always regret it immediately or soon after. Um, I've co shared a couple of positive ones, but I've also had my share of negative ones too. We, I think we all have. We've all experienced or heard stories of middle school meanness you know, middle school meanness can be kind of the worst. Um, somebody makes comments about, you know, another kid's teeth or their bird legs, which was my thing, um, their weight or some physical thing, you know, and it just, the recipient carries the weight of that comment with them for years. And maybe yours was something like that and you're still kind of, in the back of your mind, it still rattles around and makes you feel insecure sometimes. Um, maybe you've been on the receiving end of that and it just happens, but words matter and words carry weight. So I wanna talk about a few quick principles about words that I think are really, really important for us to remember. And then we'll talk about a couple of practical applications and ways that we can apply it. But um, I, think about, I think about these truths, these principles, I want you to think about them in the context of your work environment. Think about these principles as it relates to your work environment. Think about them as it relates to just your general relationships and then really think about them as it relates to your, to your parenting or your grandparenting or your, your immediate family because I think it, um, they're all so applicable across the board um, for women and for men. So it's not um, just, just for women, certainly. Um, the first one is our words can strengthen our influence. Our words can strengthen our influence. One way our words can strengthen our influence is by not saying them. You know, just kind of sucking it back in before it comes out. People who are quiet are often perceived as wise. Did you know that? There's been lots of research about that. People who are quiet are often receive, um, perceived as wise. Why? Because actual wise people know how to not say stuff. They just know how to not say stuff sometimes. They listen more so they learn more. They wait before speaking and they don't spew their unthought through thoughts. Um, they have less backtracking and forgiveness seeking to do. They get invited to share their thoughts. They nearly never interrupt. 
And all of that causes them to be perceived as a wiser person. Another way our words strengthen our influence is by being generous with gratitude. Being generous with our gratitude strengthens our influence. Did you know that unexpressed gratitude feels to other people like ingratitude? Unexpressed gratitude. Even if you're grateful but you don't say it, people feel unappreciated. Um, so err on the side of overthinking people, over-appreciating people in your work environment and in your home environment. Um, even for things that they're expected to do. Don't just thank people for when they go out of their way to do something. Thank people for even the things that they're already expected to do. What's rewarded is always repeated. When we get rewarded for something, it drives us, makes us want to repeat that action. That's just a thing in all of us. And gratitude is a simple reward. It says, I see what you did and I appreciate it. I see what you did and I appreciate it. That's what gratitude does and it builds your influence with other people. Thank your husband for taking out the trash, even though that might be his job in your home. Thank your kids for getting their homework done. Thank them for making their beds. Thank them for taking the trash can to the street. Even if those are on the refrigerator chart as something they're supposed to do, still thank them because gratitude is so important. Thank your assistant for always handling the horrible, difficult emails. Um, even though that's her job, thank her anyway. Thank your boss for the creative, not boring staff meeting. You know, think about, think about all the things that you expect, it, but when they happen, you just don't normally thank someone and, and err on the side of overthinking because gratitude goes a long way in our families and in our work environments. And um, gratitude is always life-giving. Those are life-giving words. And our words can strengthen our influence. The second principle is our words can undermine our influence. Our words can undermine our influence. And sadly, they can undermine our influence far faster than it took us to build that influence. You can build influence with someone or with the people in your office for five years, and you can lose that influence in five minutes with your words. It's not fair, but it's true. It just is. When we use our words poorly, we unnecessarily give up influence at work and at home because our words can undermine our influence. The third principle about words is words are not equally weighted. Words are not equally weighted. The deck is sort of stacked against us because negative words are weightier than positive words. So here's where I want to share some more of that um, research I told you about. And, um, I'm going to share this piece of research, and again, I stole it from my friend Jamie. But I felt it was irresponsible just to regurgitate his research, so I paid $8.95 to the Harvard Business Review, and I read the whole article myself. <laughs> but then I found that there were all kinds of um, follow-up studies that had been done in different arenas. So um, I'm, I'm glad that I read it because it was super interesting. But the Harvard Re Business Review reported on a study by a psychologist named John Gottman about the ratio between positive and negative words and their impact on people. They studied several different groups, and they compared the use of life-giving words to the use of life-taking words. And specifically, they were looking for a correlation between that ratio and the health and productivity of people's work and home lives. The study became a fad, and so other studies immediately followed. And they followed these people for long periods of time. It wasn't just a, hey, let's do this quick little idea I have. This was like, you know, a decade of following people um, and, and, and following up on the, on the study. But what they found was in marriages, they determined there was a very strong correlation between the positive and negative word ratio of a couple and the success of their marriage. And that's not a surprise to any of us, but here's the kicker. He determined that the ideal ratio for a successful marriage was five positive words to one negative word. Five to one was the key for marriage success as it related to words. Five life-giving to every one life-taking. And amazingly, he predicted with 94% with 94 accuracy whether a marriage would stay together solely based on that ratio of words. Another group came along and they studied workplace teams. They studied workplace teams and they tracked those ratios and they also concluded that there was a strong relationship between the ratio of life-giving to life-taking words 
and the success of that team in a professional environment. And again, they found that the most successful work teams had a five to one ratio. Then child psychologists, child specialists got in on the same study and they did it from a parenting perspective and they confirmed that Gottman nailed it. Five to one was, um, was the, would maximize a child's motivation, their self-esteem and healthy emotional growth. Five to one. Now the one, especially in parenting, the one word is important because you gotta have discipline, you gotta have collect, co correction, you gotta have coaching, you gotta have boundaries and all that, so you have to have some hard conversations. So you can't just ignore the one, but five to one is the ideal ratio. These are for highest performing teams, best marriages, and healthiest emotional environments for kids to grow up in. But the sad thing, the research also found that people actually ended up living in the one to three ratio, but flipped than what you would want. One positive to every three negative is the actual average. So what that means for us in this room is we've probably all got a little bit of work to do on our ratio because the average ratio is three negative to one positive. And we wanna flip that script and it needs to be five to one because our words are not equally weighted. Our positive to negative, they're not equally weighted. It is not one to one, it is five to one. Our words can strengthen our, or undermine our influence and our words are not equally weighted. And then the fourth thing is the source determines the weight. The source of words determines the weight of the words. If your best girlfriend comments on how cute your outfit is and how young it makes you look, those words weigh five pounds. Those are great. You love, we all love that, right? We love to hear that. But if your 15 year old daughter or granddaughter or niece walks by the kitchen and she pauses and she's like, oh my gosh, that outfit is so cute. You look so young. Those words weigh so much more, don't they? Because your 15 year old isn't very like, I mean, our friends say nice stuff to us, but when you're 15 year, I mean, you know, just for illustration's sake, you know, imagine that that actually happened. Um, the source of those words determines the weight of the words, right? It's always the case. Um, remember the story about my dad saying, my, saying I'm a good mom? That meant so much to me because the source meant so much to me. The source was such an important one. So parents, bosses, um, co-workers, your words, especially parents and bosses, your words inherently carry more weight. They just do. You're the boss or you're the parent. Your words are going to carry more weight. The source determines the weight. And then the last thing about words is intent is irrelevant. Intent is irrelevant. The way your words land with someone are the way your words land with someone. I know that's deep. I'll say it again. The way your words land with someone, that's the way your words land. Um, your intent does not matter. If I accidentally roll over your foot with my car, your foot is broken whether I meant to do it or not, right? Your foot is still broken. Um, so if, if my words or my sarcasm injure you or hurt your feelings, even if it was not my intent, you are still injured or hurt. So don't get in the habit of putting back on someone else, um, putting it back on someone else when your words do the damage. Your intent is irrelevant. So if our words can strengthen or weaken our influence, and if our words are not equally weighted, and if the source of our words determines the weight, and if the intent of our words is irrelevant, what do we do? Since 1999, Stepping Stone has been working to keep you and our community safe. Our mission is to lessen the trauma suffered by individuals who have been abused or assaulted. We provide evaluation in a safe, caring environment to encourage collaboration of services for the benefit of the victim and their non-offending family members. We strive to increase the protections of victims and hold offenders accountable. Here at Stepping Stone, you are never alone. If you or someone you know has been a victim of child abuse or sexual assault, please know we are here for help and comfort. We offer a variety of resources to help meet your needs and get you out of difficult situations. If you are in immediate danger, please call 911 or call our fully confidential crisis number at 478-595-8339. You can also reach us at our office at 478-275-9010. My name is Jeremy Blackstock. I'm the head of school at Trinity Christian. We would invite you to come to our campus so we can show you around and discuss ways that we can partner with your family in Christian education. 
Our goal here is to teach the truth and to have students leave here prepared to serve others and serve God in their communities. What do we do? So let's get practical for just a second before we wrap up. Um, I have four ideas that I think can help us leverage the weight of our words in the best possible way. The first one is press pause, right? We, we all know that one. It's hard to do. It's easy to say. Press pause. Everybody's heard count to 10 before responding when you're angry or walk out of the room to collect yourself when you're mad at someone or mad at your child or they've done something. And there's so much wisdom in that advice because our greatest regrets come when we don't pause, when we don't pause, when we react rather than responding, when we react rather than responding. So before sending that email, before shooting off that text, maybe ask a coworker to read over it or proof it or give you some advice or um, ask her how she thinks it might land with someone. Um, one of the things that I've learned in marriage um, and in raising kids is approach is everything. Approach is everything. Andy's response to something hard that I need to tell him has everything to do with my timing, my tone, and my choice of words. I can say the same thing two entirely different ways and get it two entirely different responses, right? Same with our kids. When I need to have a hard conversation with one of my kids, it has their response has everything to do with my timing, my tone, and the words that I choose. And in our resources arena, where it's typically most of my work is done, and in our foster care um, arena at our, at our campuses, um, my timing, my tone, and my choice of words impacts how my team is going to respond 100% of the time. And I have control of that. So press pause before responding or reacting. The second practical idea is practice proportion control. We're not talking about food. Um, we're talking about words. Practice proportion control. Um, what is your current ratio of life-giving to life-taking words? I mean, if you're really honest and you think about it in terms of your family and in terms of your work environment, what is your ratio with your coworkers, employees, in your relationships, in your marriage, with your kids? Think about your current proportion and think about the proportion you want it to be and then come up with a plan to get there. Change some word habits in your home. Practice showing gratitude. Lose the sarcasm and train your family to lose the sarcasm. Affirm your coworkers, their, their skills and their talents and their abilities and celebrate other people with your words. Even if you don't really feel like it, do it anyway. Do the same for your spouse and your kids and your mother-in-law, you know, if you have one. Um, so press pause first, practice proportion control, and then the third thing is, this is really a big deal, and I think it's something we don't think so much about. When your words hurt someone, own it, apologize, and allow for recovery time. Own it, apologize, and allow for recovery time. Own it, don't defend yourself, don't blame, just simply own it. I can see how the words I chose hurt you. And then close your mouth. Don't try to explain. Don't say, I didn't mean it the way you took it. Don't say, well, I said that because, because then you're actually saying it again. So don't do that. Um, just simply own it. Own it and then apologize. Keep your apology short and sweet. I'm so sorry my words hurt you. I hope you'll forgive me. I, I'm so sorry my words hurt you. Sorry doesn't cut it. We never let our kids, you know, our kids would say something to each other, do something, and we'd make them apologize and they'd be like, sorry. And we're like, yeah, no, that's not an apology. Let's go over that again. We're gonna hit, re, you know, rewind. We never let them do that. They had to say the other person's name. Garrett, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. Allie, I'm so sorry, blah, 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 blah. They had to fill in the blank after I am so sorry. And it had to be tone, too. We talked a lot about tone. Dad, I'm so sorry I called you a stupid doo-doo head under my breath. I, you know, I didn't mean, um, you aren't one, and I hope you'll forgive me. You know, so we practiced all that. was a real one when Garrett was three, four, sitting on the counter, breakfast counter at Mom and Dad's, and Andy told him it was time to go take a bath, you know, or something. And he goes, stupid doo-doo head. <laughs> and mom, who, who they turned into different people with grandchildren. They were not the same people who raised me. And she was like, oh, oh, I don't think he meant it. I'm like, he called him a stupid dude. He did. <laughs> you can't get him out of that one. I digress. Anyway, so own it, apologize, and allow for recovery time. 
Don't ask someone if they will forgive you. While, why, if, while someone is hurting, you say, will you forgive me? They feel obligated to give you an answer and they really might not be ready. You've got to let them, you, you know, they're in pain still. And instead, after you apologize, say something like, when you're ready, I hope you will forgive me. You don't get to dictate how long somebody needs recovery, needs for recovery. The fourth and last thing is, um, well, so own it, apologize, um, and then allow for recovery time. The last practical thing I'll share as it relates to our words is guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't just watch your mouth. Guard your heart. Luke, who traveled around with the Apostle Paul and wrote most of the book of Acts and then, of course, wrote the book of Luke in our Bibles, he said this, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Solomon, again, the wisest man to ever live besides Jesus, said in one of his Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And if that's the case, guarding our hearts is so important. It's active. Guarding our hearts is active, not passive. We guard our hearts by being diligent and vigilant about what goes inside of us. What kind of movies are you watching? What kind of TV shows? What kind of YouTube videos are you watching? What are you actively putting in? What are you passively allowing in? And it's so important for us to pause and think about that because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So guard your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, our words matter. Your words carry so much weight. So press pause, practice proportion control. When your words hurt someone, own it, apologize, and allow recovery time. And then finally, guard your heart. Um, I want to close with one final thing. Um, my daughter Allie, who's 26, was scheduled to get married April the 4th of 20. And as you know, that was like crazy time, right, with COVID. So we knew the week before it looked like the governor might do the shelter in place thing. And so on Sunday before her wedding on April 4th, she called Andy and me and she goes, um, I think we just want to get married today. And I'm like, you know, no, we're not doing that. Give me 24 hours. Just give me 24 hours. So she said, okay, we'll get married tomorrow. So Allie and Clay got married on Monday, March 30th of 2020. And it all was fine and it was great. Um, but it was, but it was kind of crazy. Her original wedding, though, was a big wedding, and so we had sent out tons of tons of cards and and uh, I mean tons of invitations and these um, response cards were of course in it with little stamped envelopes like you do when you send out um, wedding invitations. Um, so I opened one and there was nothing filled out on the response side of the card. It's just blank on the front. So I flipped it over and um, there was a note. There's a note on the back. And it was from my mom, but mom had already mailed in her response card. It was the first one I got because she was so excited. And so she had already mailed back um, hers, but my sweet Uncle Alan had given her his response card and asked her to just handle it for him. And so she did. So she verbally told me, you know, about Al whether Alan would be coming or not. And so, so I didn't understand why I got this in the mail, but I flipped it over and I read it. Mom, as it turns out, didn't want to waste the stamp on the little envelope, so she decided to write me a note. She knew it my house. So I'm going to attempt to read this note to you. This is Alan's invitation that he left here for me to take care of. So instead of wasting a stamp, I decided to write you a note just to say how precious you are, my little middle child. Dad and I feel so blessed by our children and the people they have become as well as their choices and spouses. And you, our precious middle child, are all anyone could ever want in a daughter and more. Smart, beautiful, loving, and a wonderful mother to three of our delightful grandchildren. Thank you for being who you are, Mom. Aww. So those are life-giving words, wouldn't you say? Um, and a year and a half later, I still have it. It sits up on the shelf above my desk, leaning on a picture, our family, family picture. Um, I will always have this note. For the rest of my years that I'm breathing, I will have this note because she's my mom and her words weigh a thousand pounds. And for you, there are people in your life who, for them, your words weigh a thousand pounds. 
And those are such important things to pay attention to. So I'm going to pray for you, if that's okay. And then we're going to turn this over and let y'all have a, some table discussion. On the back of those cards, those pretty cards they made and put on your tables, there's some discussion questions. So um, just spend a little time with that. But before we do that, I'll pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are um, we're so grateful that uh, you have surrounded us with people that we can love. And one of the greatest ways we can love is by using our words appropriately. Thank you for the wisdom we find in scripture that talks about that very thing. And um, so God, I just pray that you'd be with each one of us in this room, the women and the men. And would you allow us to view our influence um, and use our words in such a way that we honor you and that we honor the people around us and, and let us recognize when our words are heavy. And even when they're not, Father, let us just recognize that, that um, we're a reflection of you. We're so grateful. We're grateful for this place and this time and the food. And um, I just thank you for friendships, Father. I pray that you would bless the time around the table now. In Jesus' name, amen. Conservative treatment options are typically where we start with both knee and hip arthritis. So if you come in to see us and your hip is beginning to be arthritic or your knees beginning to be arthritic, there's sort of a stepwise approach that we take. Anti-inflammatories, which are medicines like Motrin, Advil, Aleve are usually sort of first line. We have prescription forms of those medications that we can use. In our elderly population, though, that becomes a little more difficult because they have comorbidities, things like diabetes or stomach ulcers or disease that they can't take those medications even hypertension so we'll try to treat them with medications if it's appropriate when it's not then we go on to things like injections so cortisone injections or there's these things called visco injections or visco supplements which are lubricating type injections that we can use to treat knee arthritis as well as hip arthritis to try to control people's pain and a lot of times we do that for years for people before they get to the point where those are no longer working and we're ready to talk about knee or hip replacement